Okay, so this is judging model effectiveness. So we had, it, we're switching the order of eight and nine. So next week, Kevin's going to talk about a model workflow, but we're going to, but this week we're doing judging model effectiveness. Um, so I hope everyone's okay with that. And if people are doing any prep, they didn't prep for the wrong chapter. Um, I'm going to be trying to do this. So I've, I've recently, so I'm actually on a Chromebook at the minute and, um, Basically, you can't you can't download our studio, so I thought I'd give our studio cloud a bash. So this is our studio cloud. Is the text size okay for everyone? I can make it bigger, or um, if if everyone's okay with that. If I don't hear anything, I'll just keep it the same. But it can make it bigger. Um, yeah, and then you, great, thanks. Um, and then what we can also do, which is a new R studio. Uh, Sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll make it a little bit bigger then. Um, you can also bid for your favorite um, R Studio theme. I um, seem to be one of the few people that don't have a strong opinion about R Studio themes. I don't mind the white one. Uh, let's try. I was going to say, as long as it's dark. <laughs> uh, so that's a little bit bigger. We can get bigger as well. Um, just, just let me know. Um, and then the other feature that's new to our studio, or fairly new, what I discovered about this very recently that I really like is this use visual editor. Yep. Um, so we've we've got that. So um, yeah, judging model effectiveness. So this is um, the things that we're going to try and do in this session. Um, it's mainly using the yardstick package. Um, so that's a, a, a feature of um, tidy models, and I guess yeah, there are, there are there are three three key sections that we're going to look at, and we'll we'll go through them in turn. The last one I haven't really looked at much or or done done much on, so so that might be a bit short. Um, I'm also going to be trying, I guess, live coding or at least running code in the console. So that is you know something that's destined to fail. So we'll see how we go. Um, and also, yes, yeah, so the first, so this one, uh, chapter, sorry, cohort one, um, most of this code is in fact from um, Joe Sidlowski who did it um, and did a great job. So there's loads of cool stuff in here that I just kind of pinched basically. Um, so thanks for that. Um, right, so in terms of judging model effectiveness, which is what we're doing, the first thing to talk about, so I really like this visualization once I was happy with it. So if we've got, um, our observations and, and our predictive values from the model. This kind of just shows the idea that there's not a, there's not one truth to your model in terms of one metric that can define the best the bestness of your model, and it's and it's that simple, and you you can just easily rank them, and that's it. Um, so this one is um, optimizing for the RMSE root mean square error. Um, and this is optimizing for R squared. And so this is trying to minimize the distance between the observed and predictions um, for all of them. And this is actually trying to minimize the variance. So R squared about being variance explained. Um, that kind of, that point that it's not as simple as, it's not as simple as just having one thing. Um, and so the kind of tidy framework as well, there are lots of metrics, lots of metric sets that we can talk through. Um, yeah, so, so I quite like that. You can see the variance is lower between, the, sorry, there's more spread here, which maybe isn't what you want. Um, and there's, um, yeah, as, so going, going through the notes, I'll be, I'll be flipping between the two. Um, this isn't my meme, but it's quite nice. Um, this is just how, how it feels a lot, comparing between the two things. Um, so yeah, the, the point that there's no there's no absolute truth or best metric, um, and it's it's important what the model will be used for um, when choosing your metric. So it's that kind of having that knowledge around the situation. It's it's not as simple as oh I'm doing you know a linear regression, so I must I must do this. It's kind of what are you going to be doing? Are you going to be doing prediction? Um, are you are you using it to kind of find about out about relationships in the model anyway? Um, and then there's an example in, in the book of this, uh, talking about this, this method that, and this is how I was taught at uni a little bit, um, 
doing models where fitting a big model and then simplifying it down until there's no statistical significance difference of the level. So starting with a, starting with a big model with loads of things and then going down and down. Um, and the example, so they talk about here that they, they if you did that in, in a certain case, um, it gets to 73.3% accuracy, but really doing it with a base, a, like a, a um, just just a simple model as in classifying everyone as um, as one value, as in we're going to just say everyone is non-impaired, then you'd actually get an accuracy of 72.7% because that's it in the data. And so having saying this is the best model we're choosing is really not telling the whole story. Um, and also this kind of, this, this feels a lot about this, reading this for me, I was reminded of the, um, the, the kind of common arguments that kind of spin round and round about statistical significance and the, you know, P0.05 um, and that kind of, you know, statistically significant is different to significant as we usually use it in the English language uh, about being like noticeable. So statistical significance is saying um, we know there's a difference, but we, and not not saying we as in in this call, but oft, often it's very easy to um, misinterpret and think of significant as it's an important difference and a big difference. We think of it as scale, kind of effect size type thing. Um, and obviously statistical significance isn't doing that. There can be a very, very, very small difference but it might be statistically significant because you've got loads and loads of data. Okay, um, have I got anything else to say before we go into it? Um, so yeah, so we're looking at three different types depending on the model. Um, so depending on what your outcome variable is. So regression, if if we're trying to model something that's a continuous variable or you know numeric like like the house price in Ames, and that's what we can do. Um, second is a binary classification, and then multi-class um, classification as well. And um, the other thing as well, this kind of I think it's basically implied for a lot of tidy model for a lot of tidy models going forwards potentially. Um, but we're doing we. <laughs> For these things, the metrics, we need we need some form of truth at the other end. I, it needs to be a supervised model. These metrics don't the kind of unsupervised models is not it's not part of that. You know, if you had a K-means cluster, it's very difficult to have model metrics in the same way using Yardstick. You need you need some form of what the truth is in the test data set as well. Okay. So um oh and, and the the other thing to say as well, so we're in here, this is this is the code kind of this is building up from what we've been doing so far with a lot of it, um, as in combining a lot of these previous chapters. I had not actually been running any code before this, um, and I, I, over the course of of doing of trying to understand this chapter, I found myself learning more about the previous things because I've not really used study models before. Um, so it's definitely been good for me, um, kind of suck it and see and then realize that I didn't understand every, anything. So there we go. So if we try running this, um, do an 80-20 split for trust and test and training, um, we log the sales price as well. Um, as this this isn't this is all this is all previous stuff. And then there's a bit about the model, the workflow, and that's so we haven't actually done that yet. Um, this is that's chapter eight that we'll be doing next week. Um, in this example, so there's, I've just created two, two models, a linear model, LM, and a random forest, RF. And then I also added a silly model that I called, um, and in fact, it'll be easiest if we see it. Well, that's interesting. Let's see if I'm done that. So, so I also created a model that was my my base case, stupid example where I just thought, well, what if we just guessed the median house price um, all the time? For, so the mean the median of our training data, and just that that was the model guess. The mod, whatever whatever the input, the model guessed the median value, um, and that kind of gives a kind of base uh, a baseline for when 
basically something you know to see to see how good the model is and we can we can plot these three models um can make, make that a bit bigger um so this is the so the models were trained on the training data set the 80 percent and then this is this is how they perform on the test data set that we have um each point being one point in the test in the test data set and on the x-axis we've got the true values of the predictor that we we're going for so the true sales price and then this is what the models predicted and we can see that the linear model and the random forest seem to be doing something similar but maybe a little bit different um so this looks like the same point doesn't it the same outlier um but the rest are kind of sitting in a different place and then this check my understanding of how it works yep this matches my prediction of simple simple um predictor so when we just guess the median so it seems to be about 5.2 something um that's what it looks like because no matter what input we gave the model just said yeah i'm going to give you the median as the output so that's why it looks silly um so intuitively i guess we'd say well this model sucks compared to these two can we say which one's better out of these two um, and that's part of where yardstick comes in the yardstick package um and just um, talking about the data that we use. It's interesting, the highlight's not working. The highlight doesn't seem to work too well in, in my Chrome. So this is the, the, the shape of the data set that we're looking at. So this is one row is, um, the, we've got the true sales price of this, of this in the test data set is 5.33. The random forest predicted it was going to be 5.2. The linear model predicted it was going to be 5.23. And the, the base, simple model where it just gets the median guess 5.2 and then so you see that that's going all the way down so uh yeah yardstick now we're actually talking about yardstick um this package there are loads of metrics that we can use and all have different things and then this the links here also up here um gives a list of all the different metric types um and explains about them so if we scroll down we've got a list of tables a list of a table of the different metrics available in the yardstick grouped by type so for this example we're looking at uh, numeric because that's the outcome variable is is numeric it's the sales price and we've got all of these different options um including kind of some you know family favorites like r squared and things like that and for any one of these we can we can click and get more about it and the way the way that we we code that is we use this function metric underscore set um if i i might switch away from visual editor so that we can see the underlines a bit better so we can see metric set and then these specifying all the different metrics we want to use so you just put them in with a comma between each one and then we can apply them apply this as a function this uh, this metric set is itself a function put in the predictions that's this data set and then um we can look at the output from that so we get a warning um which we'll talk about later but each so each one here so this is the mae metric which i think is mean absolute error we can double check yeah so in the same units as the original data, I think that's going to mean that it's logged sales price because that's what the transformation has been done. So MAE for the three models, linear model, random forest, simple one. Um, so it looks like the linear model and the random forest were kind of the same. Um, the we want is it's quite nice as well having having the stupid model that we're expecting to perform badly. We can we can check our understanding as well because sometimes you want things to be small sometimes you want things to be big right with your with your metrics um it's an error so we want it to be small so it looks like the linear model has beat it the linear model performs slightly worse than the random forest which performs they but and they both perform a lot better than the simple model um i i they feel kind of close don't they both being at 0 0.05 feels fairly similar especially when it's kind of more than twice as good as this one and then we've got 
other metrics as well, MSD, RMSE, and R squared. The error, the error that we've got here with R squared is that um, because the model was so simplistic, they're actually the um, you see it has zero standard deviation, and R squared is a, a measure of the amount of variance that's explained in the in the data. So, sorry, the amount of variance in the outcome that is explained in the model, and because the there is no variance in the predictions, it, it pulls an error. Basically, it's bad, as in if something like that's happening, especially, I think it's fair to say that the model is bad. Um, and we can also, so here we uh, we want R squared to be as big as possible. And so it looks like the random forest wins this one. So if we, if we go through, it looks like, so smallest one out of these three wins, right? So that would be the, random forest on this one. And then here, um, MSD is, mean signed deviation, um, which is one I've, I've not seen before, but I just um, threw it in because. So it's the average differences between truth and um, estimate. So I guess you want that to be as close to zero as possible. And we have, the linear model is the smallest. So the linear model, so it was random forest did better on MAE, linear model did better on MSD, and then RMSE, it's another error, so we want it to be as small as possible, and random forest win, wins. But again, it, feel, it feels like, to be honest, the linear model and the random forest are fairly close for a lot of these, doesn't it? Um, and the simple one is, is doing fairly rubbish. And then the random forest explains more of the variability in the in the data, which is why it's got a slightly higher R squared. In terms of, we could use we could use these metrics to then define, or to then choose the model type that we were using, as in we'd say, okay, we're gonna use um, a random forest based off this. Um, again, it's that thing about, well, what are we using it for? Um, and it's, I think it, the thing that Yardstick and these metrics help with is they help add to, add to that thought process about about which model to choose and why. Um, there are also other things like, yeah, what are you going to use it for? What it, it, explainability of the model is something that often comes up um, when I've kind of seen these things. It's easier for people to understand why a linear model is doing what it's doing compared to a random forest, for example. So that might sway you more in that direction. Um, but if you're just trying to get as close predictions as possible, then maybe you choose the random forest. There was also, um, some so this is a more complex example doing the same thing and this is this is the output from that so i'll zoom in a bit oh that was too far yeah so this is picking every single every single metric for um for the regression techniques so we've got continuous outcome variable and we've got so the, this is really helpful so this was this was added in by um joe i think very helpful kind of saying when you'd want to choose each of these metrics for each, you know, depending on depending on what what your model is being used for. Um, so the difference between, you know, you want, so for R squared, you want, you cared about the consistency um, and not the accuracy of the model so much. Um, and then the, the interesting things here about like, how, how problematic is it to have some variables be very badly wrong so so large outliers um is is that you know what's the relationship between something being a lot wrong compared to it being a little wrong you know does it scale linearly is there is it you know is it really really bad to have a big error so it's because you should penalize it more um and depending on the answer to that question which is kind of depending what you're using your model for um you might choose a different metric from the yardstick package um, and then we've got, we've got all these other ones as well. Um, I think, yeah, the don't, I, I wouldn't worry too much about the actual plots because it looks like they're doing, these models are doing exactly the same thing most of the time, as in the same model is being chosen, um, apart from here. An easy way to calculate accuracy, apparently that. Um, and I think that's all to say about um, regression metrics. The, the, 
So this this is about it, we don't actually get to yardstick until around this point. This is when yardstick is being used. So it's, most of it is fitting the data. Um, yes, go on. I think someone was on mute that didn't need to be. I, I didn't hear a question if something was said. Um, I guess the last the last part in here is that there's there's nothing for adjusted R squared in Yardstick, um, and can, and they have reason for that. Sorry, I'm just catching up on the chat. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the idea the idea of a stupid model, your kind of your base case. Um, it's yeah, I find them quite useful for just checking checking yourself a little bit. And in fact, in this example, they've got up here. Um, so, this was a model that was set, yeah seventy three point three percent accurate. The stupid model of 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 this scenario would be just assuming that assuming one version of the class, so assuming that everything all the time the patient was unimpaired because seventy two point seven percent of them were. So you get it right seventy two point seven percent of the time, even though your model is garbage because it's not actually doing anything. It's just saying, yeah, you're fine all the time. Um, and yeah, that will will come to that now. Unless there are any questions about regression stuff. Okay. Um, so yeah, binary classification metrics. So this is when instead of having a, a, a numeric or continuous outcome, so we were looking at sales price here, um, we have a binary outcome. And in, in this, what we're going to use is uh, value, so if I can find it, uh, called un, under budget. Um, unfortunately, that's gone on one line, but basically, it say you had a, a budget of 160,000. Actually, if, if all you cared about was whether the value of the pro the value of the property was within the budget or not, um, and then that means we get a, a binary outcome because it either is or it isn't. You know, and it can have two options. Um, so that's what we're going to use. So we're using still using um, still using aims. So we've got. Uh, I've set a, a small, small random forest here. I actually, actually had to to make my to set these parameters as, as small as possible to try and try and get something where it wasn't classifying correctly all the time, um, because really, actually, they do a good job a lot of it. Um, and this is using that the workflow that's chapter eight, but also kind of the the combination of things. So having the recipe and um, yeah setting the engine and that kind of stuff. So that's what's going on here. So this this isn't, we're not talking about yardstick yet. Um, this is fitting the model. So putting putting our, our model workflow in using the training data set. And then this is the predictions. So predicting against the test data set with our new fitted model. And this third line is binding it back um, onto the true test data set value so that we get the actual the truth alongside it. Um, so this is much the same as we had in the previous example, but it's for, um, previous example where we had those three models and the truth and those sales prices between whatever 4.5 and 5 all, all over here. We've changed it to a binary variable, so we just have zeros and ones. So 584, because that's the size of the test data set. Um, and even just looking at the first 10, we can see that the, the prediction gets it right all the time. Excuse me. Um, then, so this function conf mat gives us the confusion matrix. Um, and you have to say it, which, which column is the truth and which one is the estimate. Put that in. We can see that um, most it's doing very well most of the time. Um, and in fact, in the confusion matrix, so I end up on this page. It this is 
I, I don't know how familiar different people are. It might be kind of teach people to suck eggs or, or maybe it's, it's not so familiar, but all the, the stuff about sensitivity, specificity, um, and using that confusion matrix. So you have your true outcome. Um, in fact, we could, we could do it based off, based off this one as well. So this is the truth, whether it was a, whether it was under our budget or whether it wasn't. And then the prediction, whether it, um, whether we predicted it to be under our, our budget or not. Oh, there's one thing that I didn't mention actually that um, does come up and, and it did throw me for a while, even though it's in, it is in the chapter as well. And that is, uh, I'm gonna have to try and, try and find it. Uh, yeah, so the, the event level. Um, so tidy models assumes that in your factor, the first level is, the, the success if you think if it's a kind of if, if you're dealing with binary it's kind of the it's the the correct ones like sorry the correct one it's the the positive outcome so something like you know did the did the patient live or die or you know is it under the budget or not um it seems like elsewhere it's different um but it but what happened the first time because i didn't refactor the under under the budget variable so it was the levels were zero and one which kind of makes sense to be you know to have the levels order in terms of size it kind of feels right it meant that when calculating things like sensitivity specificity it it was doing it wrong because it was looking at you know you look at positives condition positive condition negative and they were flipped um so that's that's why that matters kind of make sure you check your facts are right um and so if we look at our confusion matrix like this so if we wanted to calculate the sen the sensitivity which is the true positive rate so it's the how many are in here over the sum of of this so it's like 291 i think actually I'm, i've i think i've not run the set seed so i'm getting slightly different ones and um, that'll teach me you can see i've got 287 here and 291 um so we can from the confusion matrix we can work out the sensitivity and specificity um or we can use the functions that exist in um, within the yardstick as well and they come out as a nice tibble and they say that the estimator is a, we're estimating a binary classifier and before it was saying um, regression or something so 0.997 so that's the sensitivity the true positive rate so that's 291 over 292 that looks about right doesn't it 0 0.997 um and then for specificity so the the true negative rate so it's 290 over 292 so there were 292 um in the test data set there were 292 that weren't under the budget i.e they were too expensive and of those 292 290 of them were correctly classified by this random forest model um, so 0.993 we can see the estimate like that um, and then there was also so again there was doing the same thing uh, as um, Joe had before with the kind of looking, looking at all the different ones. Um, and what he was doing was he was um, taking on a big, big data set and using, using some stuff that we haven't actually covered yet. Um, so if you, if you, you know, feeling, feeling excited and going through the code, the, the code afterwards, um, this stuff isn't on this stuff we haven't covered yet, as in it's not, it's late, it's using late tidy model stuff. So tuning parameters. Um, so if, if that's not familiar to you, um, which it wasn't to me, I've not had seen the syntax before, and um, that's because we haven't covered it yet. So that's fine. Um, but that's that's later on in tidy models, um, comparing models, resampling, retuning. Um, but and what he was doing in in here, which is quite cool, is tuning the parameters and picking the best model for all these different metrics that existed. Um, to create this thing. So this was the, the model with the best sensitivity, I think, the model with the best specificity. Um, and that, 
I, I'm sorry, again, we could look in uh, metric types and look for um, the, all the classification metrics that exist. Um, so there are lots of them, of which sensitivity and specificity are the two kind of common ones that, that we think about a lot. There's also accuracy and all that. Um, any questions about any of that or anything not make sense or anything gone wrong? Cool. Um, right, and then going on to, oh yeah, also also within um, within classification. So there's, they have um, auto GD plots for, for things that, um, so the ROC curve, so you want your model to be top left. Um, that's 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 baked in um, to um, tidy models as well. Okay, and then finally we've got multi-class classification. So this is when we have more than two um, values that our um, our outcome can take. Um, so the example they've got here is is four levels. You could, um, I was trying to think of an example. I guess someone's employment status is you'd probably think of that as a multi-class thing because you're either you know employed or a student or unemployed or retired. You know there are there are distinct boxes that you're in, but there and there's more than two. Um, so this happens. This can happen a lot. Um, the I I didn't get too far into this. It seems seems basically that all the same things exist. So something like accuracy is fairly, um, it's fairly easy to make the, to make the transition from just thinking about two outcomes to thinking about many outcomes, because so going from binary to multi-class, because it's still how accurate was it, you know, how often did you get it right? That's what accuracy is a measure of. So that's saying about 70% of the time, that feels fine. Um, but then there are also things like talking about sensitivity, specificity, and other things that you can you can still do with multi-class. Um, I, I guess that this confusion matrix becomes multi-dimensional, which is maybe hard to um, think about. Um, but you you can you can do that as well, and, and there are different ways of aggregating them that go over my head. So if anyone knows stuff about this and wants to wants to kind of chip in, I've been. That's totally fine by me. Um, and the last bit in this in this chapter that they have are some pretty plots again. So um, using using the auto plot function that was used up above. So looking at all the, the different ones across these four classifications that they had, this is basically doing that same curve that we had previously, but for different models um, and the, the four different classes so how good did they do for each of the four um, outcomes and it's an easy uh, a quick way of seeing how the models compare to each other so for some reason it looks like this yellow one here um, was doing better on the f class than the others and i guess i guess this is saying that there weren't that many var values within l there weren't that, that many data points and that's why it's quite jagged um and that's that's basically it. I guess the, the so the the main the main point is that the yardstick package has lots of metrics within it. Um, depending on which scenario you're modeling, um, you use different metrics, and, and everything is in nice, tidy, groupable formats. Everything comes out as a tibble. It's nice to have consistent naming. Um, and I think I'll stop talking and sharing my screen probably as well. Cool. All right. So, and unless anyone has anything else, I don't think there's nothing in the chat, is there? No. Um, uh, uh, so, so, yeah. Um, um, my question is, uh, you know, once you have fitted, uh, let's say, uh, linear regression or any of those models, 
uh, is there a way to extract, let's say, the p values and all? Like, uh, I didn't see um, those in the you know the slides or we were showing. Like, if I was to you know uh, like build a statistical model uh, as compared to a machine learning model uh, that that I model, uh, is it possible to get the p values out of linear regression? Uh, has anyone tried that? If you are, uh, the, like, the p values for each, um, yeah, the each, coefficient. Predict, each coefficient. Yeah, from linear regression. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I also didn't see that in here. I think that's part of the. I guess that's when choosing. Yeah, part of, part of fitting the model and, and reclassifying. But yeah, I don't know how I'd do that in tidy models, and which is something that. Yeah, they, they you, you know, encapsulate these uh, uh, models internally somehow, and uh, you don't really get the same outputs as uh, if you were to run them uh, you know, on their own. Mm. Yeah, that's one of my concerns there, but maybe there's a way I need to do some exploring, you know. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else has tidy models experience or knows anything, but, but it's, it's a question I don't know the answer to. Maybe maybe we should ask on the Slack. Sorry, are we um, asking um, if you can pull p values out of uh, yardsticks so that you can benchmark the performance? Because the p values are really just a measure of sig statistical significance, yeah, rather than a measure of accuracy or um, or a range of variance. Yeah, they're, they're right. So, like you know, uh, like uh, you will get p values for the coefficients, right? Um, like whether it should be included in the model or not. Mm. A and I understand that, uh, you know, p-values make sense when um, the data is relatively small. Uh, for larger, very large data sets, like millions of rows, uh, you'd probably get a significant p-values for um, all the coefficients. Uh, but for smaller data sets itself, like, uh, is it possible, uh, is there a way to get the p-values from the coefficients or the interaction between coefficients, things like that? I see what you mean, but um, I mean, I mean, I think Luke had it right the first time, which is the p-value pulling out, pulling out the pool. Oh, Jesus Christ, sorry, I'm really tired. Uh, pulling out the p-values um, is a case of uh, selecting good um, coefficients for your model. Yeah. So that will come in the earlier process. So when you're doing um, comparisons between models, say later on and you want to compare how accurate they are, you should have a fully worked up and complete model by that point in time. So if I was, for instance, doing a uh, multiplicative time series, I'd want to have already decided what coefficients are going in there before comparing the performance of that model to say a random forest uh, model instead. Um, so that's, that's basically the way how it works. So you don't need to pull out the p-value um, because it should be, I mean, in theory, if you were using it for, say, a process like in the business case, you would have already pulled out those p-values and decided whether those uh, variant, oh, Jesus Christ, covariates were uh, accurate or not. So, like, for getting p-values, you need to have a model, right? And uh, to have a model, you should run the and this tidy models interface, but then they don't really put out p-values. Right? It's, it's in... Um... I'm looking in in chapter seven, seven point two, using using the model estimates. There's a, they they have a way of using the um, oh. COF um, to put to pull out the, that that thing that thing that reminds me of what I normally you know what I would use for fitting models. You know, each parameter is a row and with the estimate, the standard error, the p value. Okay. So that's part of parsnip, I think. But so I guess, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I see it here. Okay, so it's using a uh, luck, basically. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, I think it's. I I found a lot of a lot of when I was when I was going through the code this for the first time. There's a lot. <laughs> kind of thinking, well, there, there are so many 
there are so many different verbs and functions going on, but I could see them cropping up again and again. It's just getting used to it, I think, getting used to where they where they belong. And that's part, part of what's so useful about going through chapter by chapter is, is building up because after this one, we've finished the section, which is the basics. So hopefully, hopefully it starts making sense. <laughs> The best thing you can do if you're finding it difficult to understand is um, follow the uh, Tidy Tuesdays videos um, like, you know, Julia Silke, okay, yeah. uh, Dave Robinson, they do them, Tidy X, um, oh, and particularly uh, uh, Andrew Couch, I think, he's, mm. he's, he's really, really good. I was um, watching one of them today, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's also got a uh, GitHub channel, uh, sorry, GitHub, so it's really good to go on his GitHub and uh, you can access his code there. And that can help you know if you work through some of those videos they're really good and obviously julie is part of the team um yeah. actually building tidy models so she's got great ability to explain it yeah i thanks august and in fact i think it was maybe it was only even last week that you or someone said that in terms of youtube videos and i watched them for the first time this weekend and it was it's really useful like seeing seeing the thought process and saying, okay, well, I need to do this, and this is where this bit fits in. Because, and I think part of that, the workflow, the whole, the whole point is, is get, yeah, getting used to those different bits and where they fit in. Um, so, seeing someone who knows what they're doing, think it through, is helpful. Um, the last thing I would say is, um, if you uh, watch uh, Business Science uh, YouTube course uh, by Matt Danko, um, he he makes uh, more of a kind of like an application based use of it so he doesn't just do the tidy tuesdays stuff he actually shows you how you would apply it in a business setting and in a much more sophisticated way he doesn't give you access to code unless you pay for his learning labs um which is 200 pounds a year i don't know um i don't know what, what, if it very uh he has it in dollars so um it, the price remains the same regardless of what country you're in. But um, I find his stuff incredibly useful uh, from my perspective. I don't know what you guys are doing in your jobs, but, um, you know, mine is quite, uh, it's quite good to have someone like that. Uh, so if you follow his, you can see some really good case studies, which are, he tends to look at a lot of his data from, like, uh, Kaggle competitions instead. Mm. But it's the same kind of thing as Tidy Tuesdays things. It's perhaps a little bit more in-depth sometimes and the andrew couch stuff is also quite in depth by comparison whereas uh julia and um dave robinson um are both kind of like showcasing um the abilities a lot if you watch dave robinson he's just kind of mind blown by like the kind of like uh by the speed of him to be honest but yeah anyway good to have a look at no thanks for those recommendations oh. And also the last thing is um, the, uh, I believe what you're talking about, um, it's not actually part of, I'm not sure if it's part of Parsnip so much, but the pulling out the p-values is actually Broom. Um, I think Parsnip makes use of it, but it's actually from the Broom package. So I, I did look up, um, So it's at uh, 7.2, uh, where you use that pluck function to get the fit. Yep. Um, and then that can be used further. Like if you pass that to summary, you will get the p values from there. Yeah, uh, yeah. So so it, it is built into Parsnip, but they've uh, basically uh, what they've done is they've stolen it from Broom. Hmm, so right. it's actually from Broom, and then they just pulled it into their own. Uh, system um so you could use it from broom if you uh, weren't comfortable using tidy model system at this moment in time mm -hmm. um basically it's all part of feature engineering which is yep. selecting the right features and then once you've got down that process um like I say you then build your models and compare the different algorithms for the models to see which one provides the best accuracy which is where yardstick comes in mm -hmm. um i haven't read the workflow chapter yet so i can't really comment on that bit yeah. Yeah, the, good. yeah. No, that is really helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, unless there are any other questions, we finish there and um we'll have we'll have chapter eight next week with Kevin. Cool. All right, well, nice to see you all. Have a good week and I'll, I'll see you in a week's time. Okay, all thanks. Best. Bye.
Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Bye.